problem with giving a speech at 4 o'clock uh, in Bastrop is that you are the reason that everyone is going to be driving home during rush hour. So I apologize in advance for that. Um, it's been a while since I've uh, been at a TRIA event. I see you guys have upgraded your digs. I'm impressed. Production value has increased from my last TRIA experience, and I take that as a sign that the industry is thriving. Um, but since the last time I was at a TRIA event, uh, our governor ran for president. And the predicate of his campaign was that in the last few years, Texas created more jobs than any other state in the country. In fact, in one of those years, Texas created more jobs than every other state in the country combined. And this is a pretty remarkable statistic, and it happens to be true. And the governor would like to have us believe that it is because he was governor, or more because of the policies he enacted as governor. Tort reform, taxes, environmental policy, or lack of environmental policy. But in truth, neither the, the, the ups and downs in the Texas economy over time have not historically varied with our tax policy, our tort policy, our environmental policy, nor with the wisdom of our governors, nor the genius of our legislators. Over time, the ups and downs in the Texas economy vary according to one variable above all others, and that is the price of oil. And in the year when Texas created more jobs than the rest of the country combined, oil reached $146 a barrel. Now, $4 a gallon gasoline was devastating to Texas consumers. It was devastating to the American economy. But it was really good for the state of Texas in an economic sense. And, and it made me think, in a state that gets 15% of its GDP from the energy industry, what are we going to do economically when the evolution, whatever the timeline it is, when the inevitable evolution to alternative energies comes our way? Most Texans' first instinct is to fight that evolution. But the history of technological advancement is that you cannot win that fight. And that's why I believe so strongly that we need to lead it instead. The, when, when the media industry evolved from broadcast radio to broadcast television, the legacy broadcasters, the radio leaders, led that evolution. ABC, CBS, and NBC were radio companies first. And they leveraged their, their human capital and their financial capital derived from their leadership in the radio industry to turn the corner, to lead the evolution into television and secured their dominance of the media for the next five decades. But when the media industry evolved from broadcast television to the internet, they didn't see it coming. And a couple of kids in garages in Northern California built companies in a few years that eclipsed those legacy broadcasters. The, the energy industry is going to evolve. I don't know at what pace. I'm encouraged by what I see in the showroom here. I'm encouraged by the trends I see in global, global energy consumption. But it doesn't matter the pace. For Texas, we know we have 15% of our GDP at stake in being a part of that evolution. And one of our distinct competitive advantages in preparing for the future is our status as the legacy headquarters of the energy industry, if we use it well. The windfall that we get in revenue from high oil prices, from abundant gas production, that is something that we ought to think about strategies to channel into positioning ourselves as leaders in this evolutionary process. Now, I've been saying that for five years. Five years ago, about five years ago, a bunch of things happened all at once. We were fighting an unpopular war in the Middle East that had something, if not everything, to do with oil. Oil prices were causing consumers to have to make 
severe cutbacks in their discretionary budgets because of the price of gasoline and the impact that had on their household budget. And a hurricane nearly wiped out the city of New Orleans, which may have had nothing to do with climate change, but it gave everybody a material, tangible way to understand the risk of cataclysmic climate change. And at that time, Americans were ready to act. And Barack Obama was elected president, and one of his first priorities was to address this issue. And then the economy experienced the most severe contraction it has experienced since the 1930s. And all of those, all of that momentum dissipated. All of the political commitment went away. The, it's amazing to track, in fact, the polling on the American public's opinion as to whether or not humans cause climate change. It correlates almost directly to the economy. We just don't want to believe that we have to make hard choices about our energy consumption when we're already suffering so badly economically. Now, let's hope we've got an, an enduring recovery beginning to accelerate if we don't blow it. And we just had another hurricane that made people once again realize what a threat to our very existence climate change can be. And the political momentum is back a little bit. But what I am amazed is that you don't hear the most obvious policy solution presenting itself in the discussion of the most vexing crisis we face in the immediate term, the fiscal cliff, or whatever you choose to call it. We have expenditures at the federal level way beyond our revenues. Everyone concedes, every, nearly everyone concedes, we've got to increase revenues, we've got to reduce expenditures. And no one is really talking about the most obvious most economically painless and most environmentally beneficial way to do it, which is to tax carbon. Many of us in the past have supported cap and trade, has largely the same consequence on energy consumption and the environment as a carbon tax, but that was when we didn't desperately need the revenue. Rather than letting businesses trade that revenue among themselves, the federal government needs the revenue. And this is not to fund an expansion in the size of government. This is simply to fund reduction in the deficit so that our economy can be viable in the long term. This is, among all the different tax options on the table, a lot, it, it ranks right next to raising taxes on the top 2% of income earners in the country in terms of having the least effect on job creation and GDP growth. And unlike raising taxes on the top 2% of earners, it doesn't require Republicans to violate their pledge to Grover Norquist. And it raises, by many estimates, over $100 billion a year at a fairly modest level. Real money. And, we can, and, and, and so, you know, I'm not sure why it's not on the table. I'm not sure why it's not the central proposition on the table. My hope is that maybe when they get to December 29th and they're looking the fiscal cliff right in the face and they're a half a trillion dollars apart, somebody reaches into their back pocket and says, put a carbon tax in and the deal is done. And maybe, maybe that gets us there. I'm not optimistic that that's how this is going to end. I do think, however that what they'll probably do is enact something to say that they raised revenue and kick the can down the road a year on tax reform and expenditure reform. And in that tax reform, in the next 12 months, in the next calendar year, there's going to be something like the 1986 tax reform effort to try to lower rates and broaden taxes. And a carbon tax fits in that discussion brilliantly. And what it will do for this country economically is going to be great for us in the long term, great for us environmentally. And the question is, what does it do for Texas? I've been tempted to write an op-ed about this in a sort of a Mitt Romney suicide uh, strategy, 
uh, kind of like his Let Detroit Go Bankrupt op-ed, I want to write one that says Tax Texas. We are the biggest CO2 emitter in the country. But in fact, taxing carbon emissions, while it will hit Texas, no one will pay it more than Texas, it will also drive economic activity in Texas. It will increase GDP in Texas because the first effect it'll have is to shift energy consumption even more rapidly from coal to natural gas. So Texas actually wins in the short term from a tax on carbon. Now I said, I've been saying for five years that, you know, we've got to make this, we've got to make the turn. We've got to change uh, the way we consume and produce energy in Texas, in the country, and in the world. And we did. But it wasn't the way I was advocating. We did. I've said disruptive technology is going to come along like the internet did to the media industry. And it's going to catch us asleep at the switch if we're not careful. The disruptive technology that came along in the last five years is hydraulic fracturing. And hydraulic fracturing has had unbelievable influences on the environment and on energy, both positive and negative. The positive one is obvious. 7% of the nation's energy consumption has shifted from coal to natural gas without any federal policy initiative to do it, just because of the market dynamic. And that has reduced this country's CO2 emissions materially. That ha and, and at the same time that it's done that, it's brought down the price of electricity in a way that has been good for consumers and good for American economic competitiveness. But, I like to joke, my legislative director once said to me, you know, after a meeting with some solar folks that I hadn't been able to attend, he said, well, I said, what was the, what was the bottom line? He said, well, uh, they say three years till grid parity, which was the same thing they had said two years before that and two years before that. But it's not because solar hasn't been hitting its marks in terms of bringing down price and increasing efficiency. In fact, it's something you all know better than me. It's reduced price by something like 70% in the past 18 to 24 month time frame. It's that the bogey it has to hit for grid parity keeps going down because of the effect on natu of natural gas on electricity prices. It's easy to view that as a bad thing, but I think the way we ought to view it is as an opportunity because it has created capacity in the electricity mar marketplace for us to invest. So while we're enjoying this period of relatively low-priced electricity, we have an opportunity without impositioning or harming consumers or the economy to put a little surcharge on electricity to stand up the renewable energies of the future. It's never been a better time. When I talked about that confluence of circumstances that lent itself five years ago to the advancement of renewable energy, the one thing working against us then was that electricity prices were high. And it was awfully hard to ask consumers to pay more for electricity than what the lowest possible price in the market was then. Now electricity prices are low. And we can, without getting anywhere near what the prices were back then, we can put some additional cost into the system in a way that helps advance the new technologies, the clean technologies of the future. My thinking on this is informed by an experience I had at, um, at a, a, an event sponsored by the University of Texas bringing young Hispanic high school students who had demonstrated the potential for future leadership uh, up from the Rio Grande Valley to spend a week at UT uh, learning what, partly about what college is like, but partly about different issues. And they had uh, policy folks come and speak to them, and I was one of the speakers. And they asked me to lead a group discussion on renewable energy. And the kids had gotten to choose which group they wanted to go to. So all the kids in my group had chosen renewable energy as the issue they wanted to learn about and work on. And so we went around the room, and I asked them, you know, why they had chosen this issue. And most of them had chosen it because they were looking for a way to bring down their household utility bill. They didn't think of renewable energy as being more expensive. They assumed it would be less expensive. 
And the reason they cared about it was because these were all high school students who had a job outside of school, the primary purpose of which was to help their parents pay their household bills, and the utility bill was the biggest one of those. The cost of electricity matters to people. It matters in a very material and visceral way. And I've always believed that in the long term, our renewable energy future depends on renewable energy being cheaper. And it should be. It should be. You don't have to pay for fuel. We're never going to run out of sunlight and wind. It's just a matter of getting the technology caught up to the demand. Think about what it costs to generate electricity from a piece of coal. Somebody has to dig the coal up, Somebody, ha which is no small matter. Somebody has to transport it to a power plant. Somebody has to build a multi-billion dollar power plant, and then they have to transport the electricity from the power plant to the user. It's extraordinarily costly. It only works because of immense scale, historical subsidies, and a history that has enabled costs to come down through a lot of investment, both public and private. When we have matched that type of investment and innovation and resourcefulness in the renewable energy industry, there is no doubt in my mind that electricity is going to be cheaper. No doubt in my mind. But obviously, not yet. Not in the immediate to near term. And the story I, I tell my colleagues in the legislature about why it makes sense for us to invest in getting renewable energy to the point where it is cheaper is the story of the iPhone. Did any of you buy the first generation iPhone when it first hit the stores? In this crowd, I am certain somebody did. Yep, there's the sucker. Okay. You bought a phone $100 more expensive than the rest of us, and it wasn't even 3G technology yet. But thanks to you, and a lot of people like you, the rest of us got the benefit of Apple's advancements in the manufacturing process that brought the price down, of the economies of scale that enabled Apple to bring the price down, of their investments in innovation that made the product better. The rest of us got a better product because of the early adopters. But you had a cooler phone than we did for six months. Same is true of people who buy big screen TVs. They paid $10,000 for the first big screen TVs for a TV you can now get at Walmart for $500, right? But you can only get it at Walmart for $500 because enough people paid $10,000 for it when it first came out. And they had a reason to pay $10,000. They had a cooler TV than the rest of us for a little while. The difference between this and renewable energy is that if I put solar panels on my roof at my home, when I go flip the light switch on, the lights flip on the exact same as they had, as they would have if I was using coal to power my house. There is no difference to the end user between clean energy and dirty energy. So the only reason to invest in it is if it's either cheaper or if you really value the psychic benefit of being clean. And there's a problem, which is that it's actually never rational. Given that I'm not getting a cooler phone, I'm not getting a cooler TV, there's never a rational moment to buy solar. Because it'll always be cheaper tomorrow than it is today. And tomorrow, it would still make more sense to wait until the next day. Because every day that goes by, it gets cheaper and more efficient. And there's never a rational moment to buy. I agonize every time I've got to buy a new laptop, right? Because I know if I wait a couple more months, there will be some new thing that comes with it. And it'll be a little bit cheaper and it'll be a little bit more powerful. But ultimately, my old laptop breaks down and I've got to buy a new one. I don't have to buy a new source of energy generation. And so the only thing that triggers me to buy is if it's cheaper. And the only thing that makes it cheaper until we get the economies of scale, until we get the innovations that make it cheaper without subsidy, the only thing that makes me buy now is some form of government support, some form of subsidy. It's the only way we get there. But if we don't have early adopters, 
we never get the innovations that made the iPhone better and better and better with each iteration. We never get the economy of scale that brings the production costs lower and lower and lower. This legislature, how does all of this affect this legislature? I've been saying most of what I've just said to you for four sessions now. And we've come close, but we've never gotten across the finish line with any meaningful advancement of the renewable energy cause in, in the four sessions I've been there. Uh, and we're probably further from that finish line now than we were five years ago. Uh, nationally, we had an election that most people interpret as something that will reign in the extreme conservatism that dominated the narrative for the past two years, bring Republicans back toward the center. Uh, that was not the lesson of this election cycle in Texas, unfortunately. In Texas, uh, the le and I don't know y'all's politics, I'm sure that there are people here from across the spectrum, but in Texas, you need to know the lesson of this last election cycle was for Republican politicians, don't let what da happened to David Dewhurst happen to you. Don't let anyone get to your right. So while you will see the Republican Party nationally hopefully restoring, you know, returning to the center of the conservative spectrum. In Texas, the lesson of this last election cycle was you're, you're at risk if there is any space on your right. And you will not see, I don't believe, this Republican Party in Texas moving back to the center. That has made them skeptical of anything that involves climate change, anything that involves renewable energy and government support. Uh, and that has made our, our road in the legislature a difficult one. The first thing we have to do is make sure we defend the laws that are beneficial to renewable energy now. Chapter 313, the Texas Economic Development Act, is going to be under scrutiny. It's up for sunset review. It's something that has been really valuable to wind development and has the potential to be really valuable to large-scale solar development. And it's something we need to protect. The renewable portfolio standard is the public policy that made, that made Texas the leader in the country uh, in wind development, one of the top three or four country, one, one of the top three or four in the world if we were our own country, and it's something we need to protect. Uh, and after that, I will continue to advocate for at least some initial effort at, s at supporting the solar industry through a program that puts solar on rooftops in our public schools. That's a subsidy I tend to get a more receptive audience to because it's no longer people subsidizing their neighbors or subsidizing private companies. It's subsidizing your neighborhood school, which if it can achieve uh, some operational efficiencies and reduced utility bills, that's something that accrues to the benefits of taxpayers and educators and ultimately children. Uh, we'll be fighting that fight along with you, Tria, uh, in the upcoming session, uh, but we have a long way to go in Texas. We know we're in a competitive marketplace, too. We know that Colorado and New York and Arizona and New Mexico and California and Washington and Oregon, they want to steal from Texas our position as the leader of the energy industry. They know how much it has meant to us to be the leader in oil and gas, and they want to be the leader in wind and solar and renewables in general. And we need to recognize that competition. We, at a policy level, need to be in the game to compete for that. So I'll close by uh, telling you one story just about politics, uh, trying to piggyback off Augie Garrido a little bit. My first job in politics was 1990, working for Ann Richards when she ran for governor against a guy named Clayton Williams. And I was 22 years old. I really didn't know what I was doing, and I was terrified of Ann Richards. Loved her, adored her, scared to death of her. Uh, Fifteen years later, I decided to run for office myself. Uh, everybody told me, it was 2004, everyone told me, you know, you, you need to get Ann Richards' support. She's, you know, she's still really important in Texas politics. And I knew they were right, but I found that at the age of 37, I was as scared of Ann Richards as I had been at 22. I called her up, I told her I was running, and I asked her if she would support me. And she was very stern. She said, Mark, why are you doing this? And because I was nervous, I launched into my whole stump speech. I started telling her everything that I believe in and all of the issues that I cared about and all of the ways that I could make a difference if I was elected. I poured all of my passion and idealism into this way too lengthy soliloquy. 
And when I finally ran out of breath, there was five seconds of silence on the other end of the phone. And then for the first time in all the time that I'd known her, Ann Richards softened up toward me. And she said, oh, sweetie, that may be the dumbest thing I've ever heard <laughs> in my entire life. She said, the only smart reason to run for office is because you can win. So why don't you tell me how you plan to win? Which is great advice. Uh, and not as cynical as it sounds. The politics is the art of the possible. And it is one thing to know what you believe in and to be animated by your passion and ideals. But it is another thing to get any closer to achieving them. And that is entirely the process of politics. That is entirely this really... Uh, a distasteful, unruly process of figuring out how you can get something you want knowing that you're rarely going to get everything you want. It is much better to get something than nothing. And that, that's something we kind of have to accept in the political environment we're in and do the best we can with. And I look forward to working with all of you on it. Mm -hmm.